Well, I want you to take your Bible this morning, turn to the book of Galatians. We've been studying through the book of Galatians. Chapter number 4 is where we're at. And I want to pick up there this morning and preach just for a little bit from Galatians chapter number 4 and verse 21. We uh, have been walking through this book verse by verse. We took a little break last Sunday morning to preach on... uh, Uh, really a biblical message on the purpose of community I think was the great truth that we talked about that we cannot live our faith out in isolation but God has called us to live our faith out in community would you agree with this statement just by saying amen we need one another I mean we do man I need you and and uh, and I believe that you need me and uh, I believe Barney wrote that in a song didn't he No, he said, I love you and you love me and we're a happy family. You know, if most Baptist churches opened up with that in their services, every one of them would be lying. Because most churches today are characterized by division and dissension. But the body of Christ should be an illustration to the world of what it looks like when people who are different, like different things, have different gifts, come together together and join together for one common purpose, and that is to advance the kingdom of God forward. But would you agree with me that it is so easy to get sidetracked on lots of different other things? I shared with the church congregation last Sunday night some things that the Lord has placed on my heart. And in our small group this morning, I really felt like the lesson was something that really spoke to my heart. We studied Luke chapter number 10. And the Bible says that Mary and Martha were at home and Jesus came. And the Bible says that specifically Martha welcomed him in. And he goes and sits down in in what we would probably call today the living room. And the Bible says that Mary, the one sister, sits at the feet of Jesus and just listens to him as he teaches. Martha's in the kitchen cooking because somebody's got to feed Jesus. Seems logical, right? And Martha goes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, why don't you tell Mary to get in here in the kitchen and help me? How many men have heard their wives in the kitchen cooking saying, why don't you get in here and help me? But at that moment, whatever's on television is more important than her meal she's preparing, right? Or so it is in your mind. Jesus responds to Martha and he says, Martha, there is but one thing that is necessary. But Lord, there are many things that are urgent. But Martha, there's only one thing that's necessary. And it is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Martha welcomed him. Reminds me of salvation. Martha and Mary both welcomed him into the house, but one after welcoming him was distracted by all the things that needed to be done in the house, and the other was just enamored with the fact that Jesus was in the house. And every believer from the moment of their salvation has one of those reactions. You get carried away with probably a lot of spiritual things. The one thing that is necessary, you neglect. I shared with the church congregation Sunday night that I felt like that I've been doing a lot of other things rather than the things that really as a pastor of this congregation I need to be doing. And so this morning I put it into practice. I showed up for band practice late, not on purpose, it just happened. I didn't know what the choir was going to sing till about 10.50. Not on purpose, it just happened. I printed the music out at 10.53 and just had it to them. Y'all's in here. You didn't see we didn't get started at 11.08. And I had all those things unprepared. But there's one thing I'm ready to do, and that's preach. I mean, I'm flat, ready to preach. And some of y'all are sitting there thinking, won't you get to it? (laughs) And I will. Here directly. But the book of Galatians is a book that is filled with examples of people who get caught up in all the religiosity all the practices of Christianity, but they miss the person of Christianity. They're church attenders, tithers, givers, not only of money, but of talents and treasures and spiritual gifts perhaps, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. We often 
I think, are guilty of dividing the Bible up into two sections as if we're looking at two different versions of God. Well, I've heard people say, well, in the Old Testament, God was like this, but in the New Testament, God is like this. How many of you know that there's no difference between God? He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And whatever he was about in the Old Testament, he's about in the New Testament. God has always had the same redemption plan. And it was a plan that was by, through, and because of one of my favorite Bible words, and that is the word grace. This morning I got up and I I logged on to Twitter. I don't think you log on anymore. You pretty much stay signed in. But I went to the Twitter app and the Facebook app and I saw that one of my favorite evangelists had passed away this morning. He stepped into glory. His name was Brother Bill Stafford. They called him Wild Bill Stafford. Several years he suffered from dementia until it finally took his life this morning. And I thought to honor him I would throw a quote in of his. Bill Stafford said anything above hell is grace. Anything above hell is grace. And Paul reminds these believers that God is a God of grace and he does so by using an interesting method. He's going to tell us a story by using people that we already know about. In fact, he's going to use maybe what I would call the first family of the Bible. You could make an argument that it's Adam and Eve, but Lord, we don't want to use them too much as our example. So I chose two people to call them the first family of the Bible that we're encountering in Genesis chapter 12. We know them as Abraham and Sarah. They're the, perhaps the George and Martha Washington of the Bible. They're the founders of God's people like those two were of our nation. Together we are going to this morning explore some of these family matters that creep up in this passage of Scripture. I want you to begin reading with me at verse number 21. Paul says this, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you, do you not hear the law? Do you not hear it? For, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through... Everybody say that next word. Promise. Boy, if you're an underliner, that's a word you need to underline in your Bible. Which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is, everybody say that next word, free. Last Sunday night I preached from John chapter number 8. You know what Brother Billy, John, what Jesus says in John chapter number 8? He says, if the Son has made you, then you are free in thee. Which is the mother of us all. For it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout. You who are not in labor for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. We brethren, Paul's talking to the believers... We brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. How many of you know that the chapter divisions and the verse divisions are not inspired? They're added by fallible men just to help us to have a smooth division of the text. Sure would be hard for the preacher to get up and say, hey, turn to that passage in Galatians where they talk about the two brothers. I mean, that would be really difficult. So we have chapters and verses that we can call to your attention to find the text very easily. I would say to you that chapter 5, verse 1 is the concluding statement on everything Paul has just said. One of my favorite verses in all the Word of God. Stand fast, therefore. You know what I'm about to say, right? What is the therefore, therefore? It's a connecting word, points back to what was just said to give you the conclusion of what he's about to say. In light of all that I've just said, Paul says, stand fast. In the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. 
Father, help us to preach this morning with Holy Spirit anointing. God, help us to do through this time what we cannot do in our own strength and power, but what we can do if you'll help us this morning. Set my words on fire, I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement said, Amen. I don't always take pride in my points, but man, this morning I'm, I'm really proud of my points. Can I share my three points with you this morning? So I want to divide this passage into three sections. I shared this with my father-in-law on the golf course Friday. I said, this is pretty good, ain't it? Number one, I want to look at the brothers. Number two, I want to look at the mothers. And then number three, I want to look at the others. Now, if you like that, say, that's good. All right, and if you didn't say it, I don't care. They're still my points, amen? I'm just kidding. First with me this morning, let's look at the brothers in verse number 21. Two brothers who are the center of Paul's illustration to the Galatians. Now you remember this if you were here Sunday night. When Jesus told the Pharisees that they were in bondage in John chapter number 8, they said, we're not in bondage because we are of Abraham. Very likely it is possible that the people in Galatians had the very same explanation to Paul that the people in John chapter 8 said. Paul, we're not in bondage. We are of Abraham. Abraham. Paul said, well, let me call to your attention the fact that in Genesis chapter number 12 and following, there were two sons that were of Abraham, but they were from two very different situations. Consider, he said, that number one, they had two different mothers. The first son that Abraham had was a boy by the name of Ishmael, and he was born of Abraham and what Paul calls the bondwoman, whose name was Hagar. Isaac was born not of the bondwoman, but of the free woman whose name is Sarah. So let's just make sure we're clear. Abraham has been called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Abraham, before God called him, was a godless man. Anybody in here glad this morning that when God starts calling people, he's not looking for people who are already previously holy. But he's looking for people who are willing to empty themselves so that they might be filled with his holiness. And the reason that's good news for you is because you've never been previously holy apart from Christ. So if God was looking for that, guess what? You wouldn't make the cut. You wouldn't even be the last pick. You wouldn't have ever gotten picked. So they were of different mothers. In this passage, Paul never points to their common father. Ishmael and Isaac have common father. Abraham called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. God says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through you. And all the nations that bless you will be blessed. And all the nations that curse you will be cursed. And so I always want to be in a nation. And I want to tell you, I'm not a single issue voter, but I want to promise. I will never vote for a president who does not unequivocally and unashamedly stand with the nation of Israel. Never. I don't care if he's a Republican. I will not do it. Why? Because I believe the Word of God. I believe it when God said any nation that curses Israel will be cursed themselves. I believe it. And you're saying, preacher, it looks like we already might be cursed. Well, true, but I don't want to add to it. And so God calls Abraham out of his land. He promises to make him a great nation. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son which is going to carry all of your offspring throughout. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Abraham has two sons, Ishmael through Hagar. She is Sarah's slave. He has Isaac with Sarah later on who is called the son of promise. And so one line, this line that comes down through Hagar and Ishmael is a line that is constantly associated with lostness. Constantly associated with lostness. But this line that comes through Isaac down from Sarah is a line that is constantly pictured as the line of salvation and the line of freedom. They were two sons who had different mothers. Can I say something? Secondly, they were two sons who had, were of a different nature. One son was born of the flesh. That was Ishmael. 
One was born of the Spirit. That's Isaac. Let me give you a little more background by pointing you to Genesis chapter number 15. And look at what the Bible says in verse number 1. Genesis chapter number 15 and verse number 1. Talk about the faithlessness. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. So this is before his name change, right? He's going to be Abraham, but now he's Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? You know what Abraham should have said? Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go faithless? Because God had made him a promise. You know what Abraham did? He didn't believe God. You say, how could he do that? Well, God said some things to you and me, but we have a hard time believing him ourselves, don't we? Amen? Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And so Abram said, the only solution then is to find this guy named Eleazar, who is a servant in my house, he says in verse number 4. Look at what he says in verse number 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Abraham still lacks faith. So let me tell you what he does. He gets with Sarah one day. Sarah says, Abram, Abram you know I'm old. She says, Why don't you just take my slave Hagar? Y'all conceive and bear a son, and that'll be the one that God uses to carry out your line. So Abraham and Sarah have lost total faith. It wasn't the birth of Ishmael in itself that was what caused them to be disapproved by God, but it was the scheming, the selfish planning, and the lack of trust in God. Let me say something to you this morning very boldly, very loudly, and very clearly. God will not honor you if you do not have faith in His Word. That's a principle from Scripture that is found from Genesis through Revelation. Those who doubt will not be blessed by God. You can find it in Genesis, you can find it in 2 Chronicles, and you can find it in James. Let any man who has need of wisdom, let him ask, and God will give it to him liberally. But don't you come in God's house asking with doubt. Because you might as well take the prayers that you're bringing before the Lord, and if you doubt when you ask, you might as well set them on fire. Because as we used to say, those prayers won't get any higher than the... That's exactly right. But Isaac was born of a spiritual nature. On the day of Isaac's birth, Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 years old. Could you imagine? Y'all get in the car now. We got to ride up to the hospital. Mama and Pawpaw's finally had their baby. I mean, what a thought. My father-in-law dabbled on this a couple of Sunday nights ago in his church. I don't have the audacity to illustrate it the way that he did. But what a thought. And yet Hebrews 11.11 11 gives us the bold and confident Assurance that Sarah conceived, yes, by natural means, but in a time and in a moment when it was not possible physically because God did it. The one who was barren has now become fertile. The one whose womb was dead has now become alive. And our salvation is a picture of the same thing. One who had no life has now received life. One who had no spirituality to them has been indwelt by the Spirit of God Himself. The Ishmael way is a way of self-effort. It's a way of the flesh. It's a way that is based out of works. It is a natural birth. But the way of Isaac is a way of the faith. It's a way of the Spirit of God. It is the way of imputed righteousness. You say, what are the two different ways? Ishmael's way is a way that says, if I work, God will be happy. But the way of Isaac 
is to say that I'll never work to make God happy, so why don't I believe 2 Corinthians 5.21 that He made Him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. So God knew you could never do it, so instead of allowing you to try to do it, He made a way for you to get it through Jesus for free. And yet people fill the churches every Sunday morning trying to please God with their performance. Let me give you an illustration, and I'm glad I don't pastor in a big church, because if I said this in a big church, I'd probably be on the news. But on Wednesday morning, we observed what we call September 11th, 2019. It's been 18 years, isn't that right? 18 years since we were attacked. I'm not going to, let me tell you something, and this is what I'm saying right here, and this is what I'm going to say it, and I don't, I mean, I don't care if anybody gets offended because this is what I believe. You can add whatever kind of adjectives to them to describe why they did it, but I've taken a class on the Muslim world, I've read the entire Quran, those jokers were doing exactly what Muhammad taught them to do. So you can call them radical Islamic terrorists, you can call them whatever you want to. I want to tell you what they're following. They're following Muslim doctrine. And every single person who opens that book and starts to read any of it is prone to act just like they did that day. Don't tell me there's a fringe, there's a fanatic, then the rest of them ain't following what he taught. They're just dabbling in the religion. But if you get into that book and you follow what he taught, the outcome is that you believe that everybody who don't believe like we believe ought to die. That's what they teach. So, so let me ask you this. What possesses a person to come to a country, get in a plane, and fly it into a building and kill thousands of people? I'll tell you what causes them to do that. They think because they do it, they'll get to heaven. They believe a whole lot of other things. They think when they get there, there'll be a whole lot of women waiting on them. But what causes them to do that? Because they think that their works will cause them to inherit the kingdom of God. Little do they know that God has already said that their works literally make him gag. They're filthy rags. They're, they're nothing to him. There's no work you can do to inherit the approval of God. Jesus already did the deed to gain the approval of God, and you've got to come in the Jesus way or there's no other way. But for over... Six or seven thousand years, the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac have been butting heads. The Arabian people come directly from the line of Ishmael. And ever since they were fighting in the book of Genesis, they've been fighting over a tiny piece of land over in the Middle East. It's another reason why I'm glad I'm not in a big church, because if I said that, I'd, I'm telling you, they'd put me on their hit list. They have a hit list of preachers who preach against them. Jerry Vines made it. You remember that? He had, to be, he had to be followed around by security for about 10 years because he called Muhammad a pedophile. Well, do you know what Muhammad is or was? He was a pedophile. Unless you think it's okay for adult men to date 13-year-old girls. Y'all think that's okay? I don't either. The brothers, Ishmael and Isaac. Then secondly, notice with me the mothers. Hagar, the bondwoman, and Sarah, the free woman. Paul shows us that these two women are actually representatives of two different covenants. Hagar and Ishmael, the covenant of the law and the covenant of works, we call it the Mosaic Covenant. Moses goes up on the mountain to the top of Mount Sinai. God gives him the law. He comes back down. He gives it to the people. He says, if you want to be right with God, you must keep these commandments. And here's what happens to them. They become slaves to a set of rules. They can never escape the master. They're always in a cycle of trying to stay right with God by performing well enough, and they're struggling for a freedom which cannot be obtained. Paul here in Galatians chapter number 4 makes a comparison between Hagar and Mount Sinai. Hagar is a picture, Paul says, of the earthly Jerusalem. What does the earthly Jerusalem say? God received the law, God gave Moses the law at Mount Sinai. 
In 2 Samuel chapter number 5 and 6, God sends David to Jerusalem to establish his capital city. And Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, becomes the place where the law that was God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai is carried out in everyday living. They come to Jerusalem to the temple to make sacrifices. They come to Jerusalem to have contact with a high priest. They come to Jerusalem to have the law of God read to them. Everything in their life happens in earthly Jerusalem. They come to earthly Jerusalem one time and they make sacrifices. And before they even get home from making that sacrifice, they're already not right with God again and they need to make more sacrifices to eliminate the stain of sin that is in their life. It's a never-ending cycle. Boy, that's sad, preacher. It is so sad. You know what's also sad? That people in the 21st century keep trying to measure up to God's standards all while never feeling worthy enough when God has already said stop trying to perform and just start living in the reality of the relationship that you have with me because my spirit dwells inside of you. Mary and Martha were in the house with Jesus in the living room. But can I say to you this morning that Jesus is in your living room through the person of his Holy Spirit. And though you cannot see him physically, he is as real in your life as he was real to Mary and Martha that day in Luke chapter number 10. There's no difference. Yet people are trying to live in the earthly Jerusalem. But then the... The Bible writer says there is a Jerusalem that is from above. There is a Jerusalem that is from above. And and, and listen what he says about it. It is free, which is the mother of us. Everybody say that next word, all. The earthly Jerusalem, you had to be born in the right place to come in. In the heavenly Jerusalem, there's no distinction based on where you're from. In the earthly Jerusalem, you had to have the right heritage and the right racial lineage to come in. In the heavenly Jerusalem, the children's song says it better than anybody ever could. Red, yellow, black, white, they're all precious in his sight. Doesn't matter. In the heavenly Jerusalem, your social status does not matter. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter if you're a Pharisee. Doesn't matter if you're a priest in the temple. There's no social status. All can come. He died not for our sins only, John said, but for the sins of the whole wide world. I've read a lot of scripture. I've studied a lot of things. There's a lot of things in my life that I have not understood about salvation. There's a lot of things that I have not understood about how God works. There's a lot of things in the Bible as I read them in the New Testament that causes me to question. But at the end of the day, when I study and I study and I study, I always come to the same conclusion. That is this, that God's gospel is a whosoever will gospel. Mount Sinai was where the law was given. Jerusalem's the city where the law was upheld. Daily life in Jerusalem would be carried out. Moses received the law. David, somewhere around 1000 BC, established Jerusalem as the capital city. And around 1000. Years later, a man, according to Galatians chapter number 4, verse 4, who was born of a woman under the law, walked up a cobblestone street called the Via Dolorosa to the top of a hill which we call the hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. He was nailed to a cross by a Roman government on the basis of the accusations of the Jewish people, and in one moment, in one death, in one crucifixion, in one place and time, the law was fulfilled, the demands of the law were met, the penalty of the law was erased, 
And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse 55, he asks a rhetorical question. He says, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But then verse 57, he puts the cherry on top of the whole cake, and he says, Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph, to cause us to be victorious. How can this be? Because Jesus in one moment has took away the penalty of the law, took away the sting of sin, took away the power of death, and he has allowed anybody who will come into him to be made free from all of those chains. Something very interesting happened at the cross when Jesus was there. The Bible says that... that as he was hanging there, an earthquake uh, was so powerful and so strong that it caused the veil of the temple to be rent in two from top to bottom. Can I ask you something? Do you think that the veil of the temple was ripped so that God could get out? Had God been boxed up and caged like an animal? And finally Jesus has defeated death and we can release God and let him go free. Man, God's always been working in the world. God was working before the world was even formed. But the Bible teaches us that the veil was torn in two, not so that God could get out, but so that you and I could get in and understand the reality of a relationship with Him. Jesus was teaching the parable of the souls and He got to that third group and He said about them, He said, they... The seed fell on the ground. It started to go down in, but the cares of this world came up and choked it out. Is anybody like me? Wouldn't it be so much easier if the devil would just come with pick, pitchfork and, and horns and, and fire breathing? Then I could just identify him and say, Hey, that's the devil. Don't play games with him. And yet he uses a variety of circumstances to... Distract the believer from the main thing. You know what's funny about when you get into the Holy of Holies? There's nothing there. Except things that would point you to the reality of who God is. So when you come into God's presence early in the morning and you want to have a relationship with Him and you want to have a quiet time with Him and you want to read the Word of God and you want to pray, don't do God the disrespect or the disservice of having your phone laid there having your iPad flipped open. Don't wait till your kids wake up and then decide you're going to go find a quiet place because you and I both know how that works out. Get alone with only those things which will focus your attention onto the reality of who He is. And come into the realness of the presence of God within you. We've been granted access to a citizenship in the heavenly Jerusalem where we're free. Philippians chapter number 3 verse 20, Paul wrote to them concerning this very subject. And he said, for our citizenship is not of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus told Nicodemus when he came to him, Nicodemus said, how can a man enter into heaven? Jesus said, a man must be born again. These people that Jesus was talking to in John chapter number 8 were people who had not been born again. They had been born of the earthly Jerusalem, but they had not been born of the heavenly Jerusalem. And Jesus said, if a man wants to see heaven, he must be born again. So the kingdom of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, is populated with people presently who have been born again, born from above. And the consummating reality of that truth, the concluding bow as God is wrapping up the reality of his revelation to mankind. Kind of the icing on the cake, the cherry on top of the milkshake. Boy, don't you love that cherry on those Chick-fil-A milkshakes? 
My wife gets no cherry and no whipped cream. I'm like, what's wrong with you? You know what I'm saying? You sick in the head or something. You know what I mean? The cherry on top. As God's concluding his revelation, he inspires John to write in Revelation 21. And I, John, saw the new heaven and the new earth. Then I saw the new Jerusalem coming down as a bride adorned for a bridegroom. Why? Because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And then notice what verse number 3 says. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God. Some people sadly are waiting to get to heaven to experience that reality. But did you know something? God desires to tabernacle among his people now in this moment, in this time, in this very place. Nothing special about these walls. Nothing special about this room. I walk in here during the middle of the week and the lights are off. Nobody's sitting in the pews. It's just another building. But as God's people arrive on Sunday morning, as they begin to fill this sanctuary on Sunday morning, they bring someone with them who then transforms this meeting from just another Kiwanis Club meeting, just another uh, Rotary Club meeting, just another convention of people getting together and sharing ideas. It transforms that from just old run-of-the-mill circumstances into something that is supernatural, something that is beyond the pale of this world. Why? Not because there's anything special about us, but it is because of the one who dwells inside of us. He's from above. Adrian Rogers said in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people, but in the New Testament, God had a people for his temple. Which means in the Old Testament they had to go to a place to get along with God. But now everywhere we go, God is with us. If there's one conclusion I've tried to come away with as I've studied and preached through the book of Galatians, it is this. Everything about you and your relationship with God hinges on the fact that you dwell in the reality of that personal relationship with him Ishmael's descendants are still today trying to perform and hope that when they stand before Allah that he will find their good deeds have outweighed their bad deeds there's only one religion in the scope of mankind that says to the, to the person who is afar from God, there's nothing you can do to ever bring yourself close to God, so quit trying. There's no other religion in the scope of human history that has said you could never be righteous anyway, so don't even try. Just come and rest in the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. Now here's the reality, and I'm going to give my third point in about 60 seconds. The reality is that Paul contrasts for us two different people, Isaac and Ishmael, two different mothers, Sarah and Hagar, and he then tells the believers at Galatia, this is what it means for you. And it means three things. Number one, it means that you, when you try to live after the Spirit and not after the flesh, you'll be persecuted. Do you find it funny that most people would rather work for their salvation than accept it for free. It blows their mind that something so wonderful could be absolutely of no cost. 
And so constantly Paul was fighting against people who said, oh no, it's Jesus plus something else. But Paul kept on saying, it's Jesus plus nothing. The second thing that he says in this passage of Scripture that pertains to us in regards to this contrast is the, the subject of inheritance and separation. Those who live after the flesh will be separated from those who live after the Spirit. Those who live after the Spirit, those who live in the line of the promise, will one day receive an inheritance which cannot be defiled, cannot be corrupted, cannot fade away. It will last forever, but people who live after the flesh will have no inheritance. And in fact, on that day, the Bible says they'll be separated. And Jesus will say to them, depart, me, depart from me because you're a worker of iniquity. And they say, but Lord, look at all the things we've done. And Jesus says, but you lack one thing. A real and abiding presence. It's not about the performance, it's about a person. And then thirdly, it's about an obligation. Surely you don't think it's as simple as coming and believing in Jesus Christ and being saved and then never having to lift your hands and fingers again to do another thing. No, in fact, what happens is when you come to the realization that you've been bought with a price, that the blood of Jesus has been shed on your behalf, and he's brought you in the family of God, and he's redeemed you, and he's set you apart. He's freed you from the chains of sin, the chains of bondage, the chains of performance, the chains of the devil. You know what will happen? Paul says you'll no longer be a slave to sin, but you'll become a slave to righteousness. And you know what that means? That means when you realize what Jesus has done for you and you really grab a hold of it. And let me just be honest with you. The truth of the matter is that most people won't never grab a hold of it. I'm not foolish enough to think that everybody in this church has grabbed a hold of it. There's some of y'all, maybe a lot of y'all, that have never grabbed a hold of it. But when you truly realize what Jesus has done for you, the only proper response is for you to say, Lord, this is not even my life anymore. It's yours. Use it how you want to use it. That dichotomy was so true in my life. If I'd have been in the line of Ishmael, I'd have done what I wanted to do in middle school. I'd have been a pharmacist. I'd have done what I wanted to do in college in the first couple of years. I'd have been a lawyer. But because I was in the line of Isaac, I came to the realization that I didn't actually have a choice in the matter. It wasn't about what Blake wanted. It was about what God wanted. The dichotomy was real in my own life. When I realize that everything I am is only dictated by what God thinks about me and what God desires from me. And so Paul says to the Corinthian believers, he says, You have been bought with a price and now you are not your own. But is there anything more joyous Is there anything more wonderful than serving God knowing that it's not because you have to to be saved. You're not serving God because you want to get rewarded on that day when you stand before Him. But you're serving God because you love Him and you love His Word and you love His work. I said last Sunday night, I said, you know what maintains my commitment to my calling? It is the clear conviction that my calling is not from men, but my calling is from God. The old preacher used to say it this way, I wasn't mama called, and I wasn't papa sent. But my calling is directly from the Lord. And that's not just for the pastor, that's for every single believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got a calling. What, what are you doing with it? How are you serving God? If he has paid such a great price, the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ, what in the world are you doing with what he has done for you? That's an introspective question that we all have to ask ourselves this morning. What is it that I'm doing with what God has done for me? Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how it speaks to us.
Lord, I pray this morning that you would use this time of preaching for your glory. Lord, you said that if the word goes out, it would not return void. Lord, I pray that you would remind us this morning that we, brethren, as as Paul said in this word, are children of promise. Lord, I pray this morning if there's anybody under the sound of my voice who has bought into the lie of performance-based religion, that they would be freed this morning from the very thought that they would stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. I pray this morning, Lord, if there's anybody here under the sound of my voice who does not know you as their Savior and as their Lord, God, that today would be the day that they would realize that you came to this earth, born of a virgin, sinless and perfect in your living, were carried to a cross and crucified and died, but three days later you rose again. Now you've ascended to heaven at the right hand of God the Father to make intercession to open up the line of communication between sinful man and holy God. And that if we will believe in Jesus, we can be saved. Not only from a life of sin, but saved to a life of purpose. God, I pray that you would bring us to that reality this morning. God, use this time of invitation for your glory and honor. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing this morning together. Just as